We actually did this for Palo Alto Cable. Terry, were you in on that one? Uh, Terry Lonick? Uh, we did a p cable co-op uh, 15 years ago, mock tumor board, and they would run it as cable stations would for health stations at 2 in the morning and 3 in the morning when most people should be sleeping. And, and every time they ran it, we'd get a series of phone calls saying, we want to come to the tumor board. So, so we're going to give you sort of a flavor, I think, I hope, for the discussions that we have and, and, uh, and sometimes disagreements. And I think that disagreements, I, I, we have a room full of students, residents, fellows, uh, upper GI sur surgeons, lower GI surgeons, there's a colorectal surgeons, and then uh, surgeons like you met with Dr. Pulsitas and Dr. Norton who do uh, stomach, esophageal, gastric, pancreas, liver surgeries. Uh, we have, uh, we highly value our pathologists as everyone in this room should because this is a tumor which I think uh, uh, really needs a good pathologists to look at the tissue to feel comfortable that we're all talking about the same thing. And uh, Terry Longmaker is, is a pathology specialist. We can't uh, aim Dr. Kuhn's wonderful beams that you heard about earlier with millimeter precision, as he said, unless we can see the damn tumor with millimeter precision, right? I mean, you can't aim a beam unless you can see it. And we have some of the best uh, radiology equipment in the country, and we have the best radiologists to run it. And Terry Desser helps us with uh, our body imaging for all of our GI tumors, including neuroendocrine. And I would say, and, and, and will be the discussion, I, I hope, as part of this, uh, uh, the cases, is that a CT scan is not a CT scan as a CT scan. They actually differ. And there are different ways of using CT scans, and different CT scans have different capabilities that allow us to look at some unusual tumors in more accurate ways with greater resolution. So I hope to bring that to bear. And John Louie, who you met earlier, is an interventional radiologist. It's, it's wonderful having them at the tumor board because when there's something that Dr. Pulsitas or Dr. Norton cannot remove and Dr. Dr. Desser says, yes, but it's right there, I can see it, John Louis will say, yeah, well, just give me a try at it. And, and he can either ablate it or he can uh, put a, a needle, a, a catheter up next to it and squirt something at it. So, uh, so this is a multidisciplinary group. The only people that we're missing at this table would be gastroenterologists, a nuclear medicine specialist, uh, a geneticist, which we sometimes have as well, because he's a card-carrying oncologist, and who else would it be missing? That plus about 30 students and residents and fellows. So I think that the students, residents, and fellows always learn more from a good argument among experts than they do from reading a textbook. So I hope that if we argue, uh, I hope that doesn't confuse you. It's part of what we do in trying to find the best possible therapy for the patient whose scans we're reviewing. So, with that, I'm going to just launch into the first case. First case is a localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And I'm going to describe the case much like a medical student would to us if a medical student had worked up this case and then was presenting to the tumor board. This is a 55-year-old gentleman who presents with some mid-abdominal pain over the course of a couple months. He tried some antacids, but wasn't helping. His weight was pretty stable and uh, no other symptoms to speak of, so just some abdominal discomfort. He's got a high blood sugar, so he's borderline diabetic, but not on any anti-diabetic uh, uh, medications. His examination has a little bit of tenderness in the mid-epigastric region, but otherwise looked like a pretty healthy guy. And a CT scan revealed a pancreatic mass. We worked pretty quick at Stanford, so as soon as we saw the scan, he got a biopsy, and it was a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, and so the question comes up with treatments. Uh, I'm going to, Jeff, why don't you come up here if you don't mind, because it's hard to sit there and look at these scans. This is a, a, a CT scan, and I apologize for the projection, but I just wanted to have Dr. Norton talk about the CT scan, because whenever, and this was alluded to in one of the questions, whenever we find a tumor in a person that's newly diagnosed, and it's in one place, the first question we ask ourselves is, can it be removed? And so we, we defer to the surgeon and the radiologist, and I'll let Terry come to it. Terry, why don't you describe the tumor, Terry? She's okay. probably better to do it first. There's the pointer's that button. So uh, what we have here is a CT scan that's very magnified, and it's a close-up of the pancreatic region. And so just for orientation, it's a cross-section through the abdomen, and these are the kidneys back here and the spine here. 
And this is the region of a part of the pancreas called the head and uncinate process of the pancreas. And I'm not sure how well you're able to see this because the lights are on in the room, but normally the pancreatic tissue is, is pretty brightly enhancing like this. And coming off of it, we can see that there's this bilobed mass that's sticking out and going toward the middle of the patient. And it's coming up against these two bright dots right here, which are two uh, intestinal blood vessels seen in cross-section. This is the superior mesenteric artery, and this is the superior mesenteric vein. And what we look at when we look at the tumor is, does the tumor come near any of these vessels? So we can see it comes and abuts this artery, as well as flattens the back wall of this vein. And we can see this in cross-section, but often for the surgeon, it's helpful to see it in other ways too. So the current state of the art in CT scans is that we can see things in cross-section, but then we can also uh, recreate images uh, in almost in any plane that we want. So what we do is we make an image that shows the length of the vessel we're interested in and how close the tumor comes to it. So this image on the right is a specially reconstructed image that shows this vessel, the superior mesenteric artery, all along its length, like this. So this is the superior mesenteric artery, and some of the other anatomy is distorted because of the projection here, but this is the pancreatic head, and we can see the tumor now, and there's a small margin with the artery, but for the most part, it's pretty clear. But you can see that it comes up and abuts and lies against this vessel, the superior mesenteric vein. So that's um, helpful to the surgeons when planning it. So I think that the other thing that's important is the size of the tumor. So it's about five centimeters. So that's, that's a bigger tumor. And the fact that it involves the vein so so closely, especially the posterior wall of the vein. If it was standard adenocarcinoma of the pancreas or pancreas cancer, would make it unresectable. So that's kind of why the biopsy is important. So the biopsy shows that it's a neuroendocrine tumor or islet cell tumor. So these are the kind of patients we talked about where we would consider resecting the vein. And uh, since the tumor comes off the artery, that's really a good sign. So we feel like there's a good margin on the artery, and we could resect a segment of the vein and still take out the tumor and then reconstruct the vein. So we can use like the jugular vein from the neck or the superficial femoral vein from the lower extremity. So we would plan, that's a bigger operation, but we would plan working with vascular surgery and you know, develop a plan where we can actually do all these things. And I think that uh, one of the lessons here is that the the usual limitations in surgical technique that it might apply to an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas uh, don't always apply to neuroendocrine tumors. And so we can be a little bit more bold with some neuroendocrine tumors than we can with adenocarcinomas. And in fact, Dr. Norton has uh, a poster uh, later on, and Dr. Pulsitas have posters talking about doing surgeries in patients who have vascular involvement like this and showing that you can still get very good results when that might uh, make other surgeons shy away. So, uh, and, and I have to apologize, this is really terrible and I, I bet a third of the audience are throwing darts at me right now because I didn't introduce Pam Kuntz, who's my colleague who just joined us this <laughs> afternoon. And Pam is a, a medical oncologist who joined Stanford to my delight and, and the benefit of all of our patients. And she's a, a rising star in the neuroendocrine world uh, uh, internationally now. And, uh, and she's, uh, she made the mistake of having a third boy recently. And she complains of fatigue now. I just said, you know, 20 years of that and you should take care of it. <laughs> so uh, this is the octreotide scan. Uh, and in the region of the pancreas, and it looks like, it, it says it's negative. Can we trust that, Terry? <laughs> yeah, this, this was a negative scan, yeah, and um, totally yeah. The, um, the octreotide is a, it's a 
tracer that hones in on a particular kind of receptor that these tumors tend to have. And most of the time it's positive and allows you to see kind of in one imaging test all the places that the tumor has spread to. But it is negative about 10% of the time. So having a negative octreotide scan doesn't rule out uh, the presence of neuroendocrine tumor or its metastases. And you can see that kidneys ordinarily take up the octreotide, so not everything that's positive on octreotide scan is necessarily a tumor either. So uh, whenever we see a negative octreotide scan, because that's the minority of the uh, patients who have a negative octreotide scan, again, 80% 80, 80 are positive, 80-90% are positive, it does make me a little bit nervous, though, because an adenocarcinoma would be negative. So that's where we have to rely on the pathologist to give us better detail as to are we dealing with the right type of tumor here, and uh, so Terry Longacre will guide us through that. So these are a couple of um, pictures of fairly routine uh, appearing uh, pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and I think the main point to remember with pancreatic uh, tumors is that they often show a lot more varied uh, morphologic patterns under the microscope than the neuroendocrine tumors that tend to occur in the rest of the GI tract. And so sometimes it can be a bit of a problem trying to determine, particularly on a small biopsy, whether you actually have a neuroendocrine tumor or, as Dr. Norton was uh, addressing earlier, a possible uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And as he mentioned, their, uh, the uh, treating physician's entire treatment and surgical plan would uh, change tremendously if it wasn't a pancreatic endocrine tumor. But what you can see on the left, it's sort of a, you see sort of a ribbony trabecular pattern, and that's really fairly common, I think, uh, in association with uh, most neuroendocrine tumors. And when you see this pattern, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, pretty reproducibly going to be a neuroendocrine tumor. There's some Im immunohistochemical stains I'm going to show you in a moment that we can use to confirm that, in fact, it's neuroendocrine and not a carcinoma. But that's really quite good histology. In contrast, over here, what you see is a much more sort of haphazard arrangement of cells, and the, the cytoplasm is much pinker. They're much larger. The nuclei are varying in size and shape. And when we see this, then we start worrying that perhaps it's some other form of tumor that's occurring in the pancreas and not necessarily a neuroendocrine tumor. So uh, what we can do is we can uh, uh, use immunohistochemical stains to uh, try to uh, identify whether or not these tumors are, in fact, endocrine uh, tumors. And the two main stains, and I'm probably most everybody in this room is a familiar, familiar with them, uh, are chromogranin A and synaptophysin. Now, chromogranin A is by far the most uh, specific. Uh, in other words, uh, if a tumor stains with chromogranin A, uh, it's uh, in like 99% all likelihood going to be a neuroendocrine tumor. Whereas if you use this uh, less specific uh, marker, synaptophysin, there are other tumors in, that can occur that may express synaptophysin that may not be neuroendocrine tumors. But we use both because the chromogranin A, it tends to stain the large, uh, dense core uh, secretory granules, but the, uh, these granules may not always be present in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, particularly uh, those in the appendix and rectum, but occasionally even in the uh, pancreas. Some of the more uh, atypical appearing uh, neuroendocrine tumors may not stain for this marker. And so we use the synaptophysin, which tends to stain the more poorly differentiated or uh, tumors that tend to have uh, unusual histology. So I mentioned grade, uh, poorly differentiated and well differentiated, and there's a very, fairly codified grading scheme now for neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas as well as uh, throughout the GI tract. And there's basically three grades, is the grade one, two, and three, and it's based entirely on uh, how much the cells are dividing or proliferating. So uh, th there's two ways to do it. The pathologist will actually look under the microscope and actually count mitotic figures. Uh, and then uh, uh, depending on the number of mitotic figures, it will be assigned a grade one, two, or three. Or you can use an immunohistochemistry stain. And in fact, we do both now. So we'll do a formal count, and then we'll stain for a key 67, which is basically just highlight cells that are going through the cell cycle and proliferating. And these are the cutoffs. And so anything less than or equal to 2% is grade 1, 3 to 20% is grade 2, and then grade 
greater than 20% is a, a grade three, and that's a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And again, if it's a grade three tumor, uh, their entire management will change. It's a different sort of tumor. They tend to be much more, uh, they spend, tend to spread through the body a lot more rapidly. And so the oncologist will talk about that perhaps, but their treatment is completely different. So it's really important for us as pathologists to be able to make sure that we're not dealing with a grade three and we can identify a grade one or a grade two tumor. And uh, there's a uh, follow-up, a large you know, series of studies looking at uh, tumors with grade one versus two versus three uh, histology based on this my proliferation rate. And it looks like these, I mean, it, it sort of predicts how the tumor will behave. Now, there's no absolute. In general, grade ones are very slow growing tumors. Uh, grade three are very rapidly growing. And those tumors that are in grade two, it's sort of, we don't know. I mean, they're sort of somewhat in between, but they don't predict, they're not quite as predictive. I think that's it. Yeah, great, thanks. So, um, I, I always learn something. So, from this morning's talk where I talked about high grade, low grade, and intermediate grade, or well differentiated, poorly differentiated, and then in the middle, moderately differentiated, you can substitute grades one, two, and three as the same, okay? So, um, we didn't decide how to treat that, Dr. Norton, and sometimes we have debates in the tumor ward and walk out of there and say, well, wait a minute, what did we decide? <laughs> yeah, I think that, that one's pretty uh, straightforward. I think we need to do a Whipple pancreatic duodenectomy because it's in the head of the pancreas and it's a, quite a large tumor, and it also involves the vein, so we have to reconstruct the vein. So we would plan on using autologous, which means that the patient's own vein, either the and you have to use native vein. You can't use, like, for example, Gore-Tex or other things like that because it'll thrombose or clot off. So it's real important. You know, people can't live without the superior mesenteric artery and vein. We keep mentioning that. So we have to be sure those vessels are working properly. Uh, Pam, let's, say, let's suppose that Dr. Norton does exactly that surgery and, and uh, Dr. Longacre, the pathologist, says, well, it looks like uh, the margins are negative, and this does look like a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and Dr. Norton tells every patient, well, I got it all. <laughs> we got it all. But, but better go see Dr. Koontz just in case. <laughs> Do you have any, any recommendations? So I think this is actually an interesting question and one that I think will probably be addressed in future clinical trials, which is the role of treatment after surgery for a neuroendocrine tumor that's been resected. For pancreatic adenocarcinomas, we do that routinely. We use chemotherapy and or radiation for what's called adjuvant treatment or treatment after surgery. Currently, there is no role for adjuvant treatment in after removing or after completely removing a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So for this particular patient, we would go in and for my patients out there, I call this surveillance mode, where we would then monitor patients with routine scans every three to six months and then slowly stretch out those intervals. So uh, Pam is actually gonna be one of the principal investigators on a national, if not international study, trying to answer this question for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors perhaps in the six month, one year time frame. So we're trying to answer that question with research. Uh, here's another patient, a 60 year old gentleman who presents with right upper quadrant pain, that's up here people, uh, some, some weight loss and night sweats. He's otherwise healthy. Um, physical exam shows uh, he's a thin guy, he's got some tenderness over the liver, again, right upper quadrant. And when you feel the liver, you can feel it that's below, it's bigger than it should be. So it's an uh, enlarged liver. And a CT scan demonstrates that there's a pancreatic mass and there are multiple spots in that liver on the CT scan. Uh, again, we get a biopsy. It doesn't matter whether you get the biopsy of the pancreas or you get the biopsy of the liver. You get a biopsy of whatever is safest to biopsy. And this one was the liver. And the liver shows an intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumor. Um, Terry, you want to go ahead and tell us what you see? These don't project as well as they should. I'm sorry. So 
hope you can see this little arrow moving here. So again, this is, a, this is another CT cross section of the abdomen at pretty much the same level as the last one. Again, kidneys back here, spine back here, and the red arrow is indicating this mass that's again in the head of the pancreas, and this is the superior mesenteric vein here. It's coming right up against the superior mesenteric vein, so that's its local extent. But in this case, that isn't as critical because we can see when we look at the liver, which is this organ right here, normally the entire liver should look the way it does back here, pretty uniform, uh, bright appearance, but I think it's pretty obvious that there are these big, dark areas within the liver that represent metastatic disease. So this is a pretty large lesion that's occupying most of the right portion of the liver, and then there's another one right behind it. So these are quite large liver metastases, which makes the question of whether the tumor doesn't involve the vessels or does involve the vessels not uh, nearly as much of an issue. Thank you. And, and you'll notice that, as opposed to the sh pictures I showed earlier, where these tend to be bright white, this is actually darker, which might go along then with a, um, uh, with a less well differentiated. The better the be tumor behaves like neuroendocrine, the more likely they are to be the enhancing type. So it's another clue that maybe this might be a more aggressive tumor than what we otherwise want to deal with. And in addition to the CT scan, uh, this patient also had an octreotide scan. This CT scan is, is taken in a different plane. This shows in uh, the coronal plane the extent of this big mass in the right lobe of the liver, then there's another one here in the left. And in addition on this octreotide scan, not only is the liver lighting up, but we can see there's a bright spot here in the neck, which shows that the tumor has spread all the way up to the neck. And um, it's, it's a, a little bit uh, complicated why tumors tend to go up there, which probably doesn't matter, but it, it's clearly, this particular tumor has spread not just beyond the pancreas to the liver, but up into lymph nodes in the neck as well. All right, so, um, so now we have a intermediate grade tumor, which, uh, which we tend to put in with the better behaving as opposed to the very high grade, but still not good enough. And we have liver spots, we have a spot in the neck, we have a person who's having some discomfort associated with the enlarged liver. John, do you want to mention anything that you might do for that enlarged liver? Would you consider... Yeah, a local so, treatment before you, we ask Dr. Koontz what she'd do? So uh, this person has liver predominant disease and is symptomatic. Uh, there's a thing covering over the liver that is very sensitive, and so when the tumors grow and stretch that uh, liver capsule, it can be very painful. And this would be uh, someone who would benefit from liver-directed therapy, such as chemoembolization or radioembolization. Although we're not able to treat all the tumor in the entire body, I think our goal here is uh, improving symptoms and um, addressing the biggest uh, tumor. And before I usually treat patients, besides just looking at the scans, we'll see the patient, make sure their labs are good too, because that would limit my ability to treat the patient if the liver was failing. For example, if the total bilirubin uh, was above two, uh, that would tell me that the liver is not doing so well, I would just hasten their death and not really improve their life. Um, so other markers I look for would be five times normal AST, ALT, or nuanced ascites, meaning the liver's not doing so well as well. Those are all indications. And I would also make sure that the patient has a fairly good functional status. So if they're already not doing so well, maybe sleeping most of the day, that's not someone I would like to treat because, I, once again, I'm here to help people not make their life worse. So um, that's what we do, chemoembolization or radioembolization to treat the, treat, uh, the symptoms and uh, perhaps help them live a little longer. So in the tumor board, this would be one of those situations where we asked John what he could do, and even if he felt that he could help in this particular situation, we might defer to Dr. Koontz first simply because she has treatments that go everywhere, and, and if they work, then they would work not only in the liver but also in the lymph node and also in the pancreas. But it's, it's helpful to know that this person would be a candidate for the, uh, for a liver-directed approach if, in fact, that became the symptom-limiting uh, organ. So, uh, Pam, you want to talk about what you might consider? Sure. And I think that this is 
sort of the good case to discuss the new tumor, tumor board because I think the sequence of how we would offer treatments is really important. And I think knowing that we could do a chemoembolization or radioembolization um, is important. We don't really know if it's important to do that early in the disease course or later in the disease course. I think that um, for this particular patient, I would probably offer a systemic treatment first and kind of keep the liver-directed treatment in my back pocket. And what's exciting is that I think you may have addressed this earlier in the morning cases, um, but two new drugs, as many of you know, have been approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors just in May. So sunitinib or sutent and everolimus or affinitor, and those are both um, oral agents. They are used separately. Um, both were studied in large phase three clinical trials, and both showed improvement in terms of slowing the growth of the disease, and in some cases, shrinking tumors. And I think one or one of those, and again, we don't know which one should be started first, but I would probably choose one of those. And I tell most of my patients with metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that they will likely see both of those agents in their lifetime, but the sequence right now, we just don't know what is better. And so uh, a multiplicity of different options, those two most recently approved ones are certainly on the list. Uh, but we always like to discuss clinical trials, which we won't do right now, but which would be part of our tumor board discussion. The only reason we won't right now is because Pam will conclude uh, this afternoon with some clinical trial discussions. So moving away from the pancreas to the appendiceal carcinoid tumors, uh, a 30-year-old woman develops acute onset right lower quadrant abdominal pain and fevers, and she's otherwise healthy. Sounds like appendicitis. Uh, you go to the emergency room, your physical examination, she has, she's have, has a fever, she's very tender, you touch here and she jumps. Uh, she has a CT scan which shows some stranding inflammation around the appendix consistent with acute appendicitis. Uh, I'm amazed at the radiologists now that can see the appendix. In the old days, we couldn't see the pancreas or the appendix with our scans. Now we can actually see something that's that big and, and pencil thin and even see some inflammation around it and, and make a radiographic diagnosis. However, she, she ultimately needs an appendectomy, and surprisingly, the pathology reveals not just appendicitis, but a well-differentiated appendiceal carcinoid tumor. And I'd say that this is a fairly typical way of finding these, and uh, I'll let Terry talk about what she sees through the microscope. Yeah, we see this not all that infrequently. And uh, the, the, I, the good news about it is uh, the vast majority of these are really quite small, and uh, they're almost all well differentiated, and they're very, very slow growing, and they don't spread. Um, the m vast majority don't really spread beyond the appendix, unless they're starting to get really quite large or uh, more mitotically active. The interesting thing is, that remember I, when I talked about the immunostains that we use to confirm neuroendocrine tumors, some of these appendiceal carcinoid tumors don't stain with neuroendocrine markers or do so very weakly. And uh, they can show, these tumors can also show a little bit different morphology. Here what you're seeing is more tubular shaped. They almost look like they're making little glands uh, rather than those nice little ribbony nests that I showed you for the uh, pancreatic. Here's another example uh, of this carcinoid. That looks a little bit more typical for the appendiceal carcinoid. But here you start seeing it's almost lining up, a linear array. And uh, what happens sometimes with these is, uh, because these often occur in younger patients, because that's generally who's getting uh, uh, acute appendicitis, and these you often see in association with acute appendicitis, is a pathologist might look at it and think, oh, this looks like uh, metastatic carcinoma, because it looks like it's making glands, and it looks like a little bit like breast cancer. So it's really important for pathologists to be really, really aware that this is a pattern that you can see with these appendiceal car carcinoids, because metastatic breast cancer is obviously a completely different sort of prognosis, uh, uh, and, and not a good prognosis at all, as opposed to an appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and I think that that's all I have to show on. Oh. So once again, this one, though, fortunately stained with synaptophycin, and so you could say, oh, you know, don't worry about that. That's, this is a neuroendocrine tumor. 
But every once in a while, we'll get cases in on our consultation service where they're worried because they they think it's a neuroendocrine tumor, and they've done their chromogranin stain and their synaptophysin stain, and they're negative, and they're worried that maybe it's some very well differentiated carcinoma that's spread to the appendix. And uh, it's never has been in my experience. It's almost always going to be one of these incidental neuroendocrine tumors. So this is actually sort of a good news tumor if you're going to get one. <laughs> Good news tumors. Uh, you want to write that down? <laughs> um, so uh, you, it's amazing that something that's smaller than your pinky can be associated with so many different types of tumors that can arise from it. Now, all relatively rare, but whenever that happens, that's why we rely on, on someone like Terry to try to sort out the different possibilities. And, and frankly, we see sometimes com combinations of two tumor cell, cell types that, uh, that give Pam and me headaches when we start thinking about how to treat. Uh, but fortunately, many times, as uh, Terry alluded, uh, these people don't need treatment. All they need is to have their appendix out. And in fact, it's entirely possible that the appendiceal tumor precipitated the appendicitis just by blocking the, uh, the, the appendix and it gets inflamed and bursts. Or it could have been that somebody had appendicitis, because that's common, and at the time of removing the appendix, you find a very slow-growing tumor that was probably there for 10 years and it might have been there for another 20 years before anyone ever found it. So it, it can be an incidental diagnosis, as alluded to. Well, unfortunately, it's not always incidental, and, and sometimes uh, instead of finding this at the time of an appendicitis attack, you find that there's uh, metastatic disease. So here's a 70-year-old woman who presents with some uh, blood per rectum, so she, she has some rectal bleeding. She has no other symptoms and otherwise healthy, but that always gets your attention. Uh, she has a colonoscopy, which reveals a mass in the rectum, and the pathology demonstrates what's described as a well-differentiated rectal carcinoid tumor. The CT scan shows multiple liver lesions, no evidence of disease outside the liver. And because of the rectal bleeding, she undergoes surgery to, to get rid of the bleeding source. And she has what's known as an APR, which means you have a permanent colostomy, but you've removed the tumor in the rectum. Uh, and then the question is, what other treatment should be considered? So this is, uh, I'll let Terry go ahead. Uh, we have two Terrys. So they know which one I mean. <laughs> So I think it's pretty apparent what we have here. Um, the image on the left shows um, a cross section through the pelvis, and I have the, the uterus as this brightly enhancing structure here. And then just behind it, we have a cross section through the rectum, and the arrow is pointing to a round, brightly um, enhancing structure in the rectal wall, which is a pretty typical appearance for a carcinoid tumor in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, one of the hallmarks of carcinoid tumors in the gastrointestinal tract is that although they're often very small, they're um, commonly brightly enhancing. And so um, if the clinician knows that we're looking for a carcinoid, it's important for the radiologist to know that too because it affects how we acquire the scans. But in this case, we're actually able to see the primary rectal carcinoid. But then unfortunately, you can see here in the liver that... that um, almost the majority of the liver is replaced by these large masses that are splaying here, the portal vein, and also extend even over to the left side of the abdomen and uh, compressing the stomach. And so this is uh, quite a bit of the tumor is replaced by these large metastases, so much so that um, you would not be able to take these metastases out surgically because there's just so little liver left. Okay, so this setting is uh, one in which the grade really makes a huge difference because you can see there's tumor spread into, there's a quite a bulky uh, liver involvement. And if this is a grade three tumor, they would do something different. They would treat completely different than if it was a grade one or two. So this, in this scenario, grade matters a whole lot. And sometimes all we're getting in pathology are these very, very small biopsies. 
and it can and they get crushed from the biopsy pinchers and so sometimes it can be difficult to try and determine whether it's a low grade or a high grade tumor and what we do is we do those immunostains for the prolitus as a stand in that key 67 that I showed you earlier because that sort of con it helps us identify which cells are actually dividing and not but this particular example, we've got a very nice biopsy, and this is very classic pattern for this is the usual neuroendocrine tumor. The cells are all uniform in size and shape. The nuclei are small. They're round. They have uh, sort of a, what's referred to as coarse and fine, uh, or some uh, the pathologists will talk about salt and pepper chromatin because you see bigger blobs in them and smaller blobs. And you can see, uh, whoops, I guess that's all we have. So, and, and sometimes what you can see is uh, so at the periphery, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, right here, you get this sort of uh, palisading around these nests. But this is a very typical pattern. And there are no mitotic figures in this particular example at all. So even though this tumor has seems to have spread into the liver, uh, we would classify this particular example, at least on the histology, as a grade one or well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Um, so let's pause there for a second. And now we have a person whose primary tumor has been removed because it was bleeding, and we wanted to take care of the bleeding problem, who has a well-differentiated tumor that is limited to the liver, but the liver spots are rather, relatively large. Uh, this, is, this would be another situation where uh, Dr. Norton, I would ask you first, but I suspect that you're not thrilled about taking out that much liver. Yeah, I think that I think it's important to realize with neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract that location is an important important variable. Not only is histology important, but location. For example, appendiceal tumors like the one we presented, they're almost always cured by simple appendectomy, and they have a very good prognosis. Ileal carcinoid tumors have a poor prognosis, and they commonly have liver metastases or lymph, at least lymph node metastases, but they have a better prognosis than rectal carcinoids. For some reason, rectal carcinoids, although they're rare, like the case presented here, they commonly present with distant metastatic disease and they do poorly. So I think that um, in this case, you're right. I mean, there's no surgery and you have to wonder about the wisdom of doing an APR for a patient like this. So before uh, uh, people panic in the audience about this being a typical case of rectal carcinoid. Uh, Pam, you've done a search through the SEER database looking at neuroendocrine tumors and the different sites and the sites that are increasing most rapidly and what we think the relevance to that might be when people find very small ones. Do you want to comment on that? So, um, so in reference to this case, rectal carcinoids are one of the sites that at least in this large population database, which covers about 30% of the U.S., it's the largest cancer database, um, we looked at a number of different sites of the body and how common neuroendocrine tumors are at these sites and what the incidence is and what their um, rates are. And so rectal carcinoids do seem to have increasing incidence rates over about a 30-year period as do gastric carcinoids. Um, we don't know why that is. Um, perhaps it's because we're doing more colonoscopies or, or we have better diagnostic imaging. So that's something, it's a future research question that we hope to delve into. For very many, now that we are doing a lot of colonoscopies or sigmoidoscopies, because we've learned to screen for colon cancer, which we didn't do so well 20, 30 years ago, we're finding these little nubbins of neuroendocrine, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors in the, in, the, in the rectum at such a frequency that is far higher than the frequency of any patient you'd see like this. So we don't think that those have the same clinical course that this does, and that uh, perhaps by removing them, we can even eventually decrease the risk that such patients would have this. Uh, John, you want to just comment on, on the liver-specific uh, therapy? I think, once again, um, chemoembolization and radioembolization are options. I always get mixed up when, pe when patients ask me if they can do a, because they read radiofrequency ablation, because it sounds really similar, like uh, both have radio in it, but radiofrequency ablation is more for small tumors. In this case, these are large tumors. Three centimeters and below is what we do for the freezing and burning of tumors. 
and this we would do a more wide uh, approach with chemoembolization and radioembolization and would complement what uh, Dr. Koontz and Dr. Fisher do, uh, do because they're not mutually exclusive. What I have to offer and what uh, oncology has to offer, uh, they're complementary. Um, we had another case, but I think for the interest of time, make sure that uh, Dr. Bergslin has full time for her talk. We'll end it there. I'd be happy to take a few questions if there are any, uh, either related to these specific cases or, or other questions that you might think appropriate for the group. And, and uh, Emily, if you want to come up, we'll just go ahead and get your slides loaded. So this, this is a question about, um, is it necessary to sample different tumor sites within the same patient? So I think we could do it, we could do the question twice. The first would be, is it necessary to biopsy from different locations, and, and what could that tell you, and how could that inform treatment options? And then the second part is, is it necessary to stain for things like key 67 at the primary and also at the metastasis? So I think that might be my question, so I'll, try, I'll give it a uh, try. Uh, that is an issue, I think. Um, like I said, if you have a very, very small biopsy and if the tumor is heterogeneous, in other words, some areas it's dividing quite rapidly and others it's dividing slowly, I think that there probably always is a bit of a chance that it's not entirely sampled if you get a small biopsy. Even so, um, so given that, I think that that's possible. Uh, I think that uh, most folks think that if you've got a good, a, a, a fairly decent sized biopsy, in most instances, it ends up being fairly representative. In other words, if it's going to be a grade three tumor, we should be able to tell even on a small biopsy. We may need to use the key 67 to help, you know, to, to help visualize that, that cell proliferation. Um, distinguishing grade one and two is, might mean something in terms of prognosis, but in terms of therapy at this point in time, I don't, I think there, most folks are still treating all those tumors roughly the same. And so I think in most instances, we're getting pretty representative samplings. And then the issue about the primary versus the metastasis, again, there's no great, there's no large studies looking at that uh, to, to say that that really is necessary, but I think that, uh, uh, most of the time what they're doing uh, anyway is they're sampling the metastasis to be, uh, uh, because those are the easier, that's e easier access uh, tumor. And what, that's probably what you want to be looking at because that's the tumor that's actually spreading. So that's a long answer of saying I think our current uh, standard procedure of biopsy is sufficient. Now if they start doing different, they decide we're going to treat grade one and grade two tumors differently, then we might want to look into uh, biopsying more areas I would think. One more question, Lauren, then we'll move on. Okay. Um, so the question is, do MRIs show more detail than CTs for imaging the abdomen, and, and when should, how frequently should a patient have either? Well, um, the answer to that depends partly on the primary site of the tumor or where the, the tumor is suspected. I would say that for a carcinoid tumor of the gastrointestinal tract, um, such as the stomach, small bowel, or rectum. MRI does a really poor job of imaging those um, for various reasons, but one of them has to do with the very long acquisition time, and so you get a lot of bowel motion. Also, there isn't a good um, contrast agent for the bowel, and so MRI does a very bad job with the bowel. Um, however, it's, uh, with regard to the pancreas, it's, uh, you can almost go either way uh, because with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, those actually do show up pretty well on MRI. But when it comes to what we do for surveillance, most commonly is CT because CT has better spatial resolution and it's quite good at imaging uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And um, in general, we, uh, it, the surveillance interval will depend on uh, factors that the oncologist will take into account, as well as the surgeon. Did they, um, how are they treating the patient? Oftentimes we seem to, when the patient is having chemotherapy at the time, we might image them very early on just to see how they're doing at shorter intervals. 
And then once the oncologist has a sense of how well the patient is doing, then it might go to a longer interval, say three to six months or one year intervals. But it really depends on the individual patient's tumor and what it's doing. What about the radiation exposure with CT? Is that a concern? Well, um, of course, there's been a lot of publicity I mean, about... All, a lot of patients ask me that. Right, right. Well, um, the radiation exposure that you get during a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis nowadays has... Um, it's definitely increased over time because of the fact that we try to get more and more and more detail. Um, such that um, if, you're, if you have a very young person and you're going to be taking surveillance imaging over the course of many, many, many years, you might want to think about doing an MRI in that situation. Because uh, the radiation exposure is small, and in many instances, it's for any one individual CT scan, it's comparable to what, say, airline pilots would get. So it's not anywhere near the amount of radiation that's administered for a therapeutic dose, but it's cumulative. So each time you do a CT scan, you are adding incremental amount of radiation to that patient's lifetime burden. So again, it depends. If you, if you have a 70-year-old person with a neuroendocrine tumor, the number of CT scans that they'll get um, has to be weighed against the risk of them having an adverse outcome for the CTs. And by and large, the benefit from doing the CT scan uh, outweighs the really improbable risk that they would have some bad outcome. But for a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old, you might want to use a different modality.